All right. Welcome, Mid Manhattan Adult Learning Center. Carlos Rosas here with podcast number three. And our very special guest today, Israel Joseph I, former vocalist of the Bad Brains and eternal uh, independent artist. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Carlos? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. It's great seeing you. All right. So uh, we chose you. Um, for, for those of our, our viewers who are not too familiar with Bad Brains and Israel, um, well, okay, we say is that Bad Brains is just a legendary, legendary band who has influenced so many, so many musical acts of today, of yesterday, whether we're talking The Roots, The Weeknd, Gwen Stefani, The Beastie Boys, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, the uh, the list goes on and on and on. So we are very happy to have you here today, Israel. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It. Yeah, um, appreciate it. And uh, all those people you named are great artists, and we appreciate them as well. Of course, uh, they're they're amazing artists, and the things uh, that they have accomplished, I personally have loved quite a bit. So the Roots, Gwen Stefani, all of you, big up, love and peace. Glad to be a part of it. All right. All right. Just a reminder to all of our students, um, if you're here, attendance is very important. So please drop your first, last name and your teacher's name in the chat box so that we can make sure that you are accounted for. Okay. And we're in for a little bit of a treat this morning because uh, Israel, you're going to kind of bring us through a little bit of improvised music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And... Um last minute decision i just had my guitar sitting around uh this is uh my guitar for you students out there that are looking <clears throat> it's an ibanez i've uh played this guitar on my records and um it's uh i'm rather happy with this guitar um and this is uh, basically called tuning. Since we made this uh, decision at the last minute, I wasn't exactly tuned up, to be totally honest with you all, but we'll make it work as best as we can. And all you musicians out there watching this, you know what I'm going through mentally right now. But as a lesson, you can see that you just gotta remain calm, okay? Things happen. So we're going to sing a little uh, improvised version of, uh, I guess, Bob Marley's Running Away, which is easy for kids to learn or adults to learn uh, since it's just two chords. OK, it's just two chords. Actually, I'm sorry, it's drop. So it's G flat, uh, A flat. Or for some of you, G sharp. <laughs> so reggae is a very uh, progressive, soft music. You have to have the rhythm. So it's. So it's G, uh, A, A flat. A flat to what is that? D D flat. You're running and you're running and you're running away. Running and you're running and you're running away. Running and you're running and you're running away. Running and you're running, but you can't run away from yourself. 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 You must have done something wrong. Say you must 
must have done something wrong. Why you can't find a place where you belong? Well, 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 you're running away. You're running away. Todd, I love you, bro. You're running away. You're running away. Every man thinks that his burden is the heaviest. Every man thinks that his burden is the heaviest. Who feels it knows it, Lord? 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 You're running and you're running and you're running away. You're running and you're running and you're running away. You're running and you're running, running away. You're running and you're running, but you can't run away from yourself. You can't run away from yourself. Can't run away from yourself. Can't run away from yourself. You must have done something, 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 something. You don't want nobody to watch it. Watch it. Improvise. It's the education. We need some education. A New York system, public education. A New York system, adult education. I say we need the education. It's important to get your sanity, as I would really say. Some knowledge you can't get in college. Some knowledge you gotta go and seek on your own, as I would say. But you need some education. Learn to read and write. You need some education. Because everything's going to be all right. You need some education. So see how that works, people. Sometimes that's the way a song is written, too. You just start off with somebody else's groove, and then you move into your own chords. And so, you know, um, so you would start, you know, you need some education. That was all improvised, you know, because I'm sitting here with y'all. But that's really how what's going on with music. It's a vibe. As you can see, Bob Marley said where I just kind of, it's like Bob was playing and I just kind of, all right, Bob, I'll sit in and sing this one now. So <laughs> it's, it's just a flow. You have to get into the flow. Same thing with knowledge and your knowledge of yourself, knowledge of who you are. It's about getting into the flow, the energy of life. Um, uh, you know, we're talking to uh, adults who are furthering their, their education. Uh, this is the most important thing, in my opinion, that a, uh, that a person could do for themselves besides seeking uh, some, some, some kind of... Uh, you know, of course, spiritual spiritual upliftment is apex on the on the uh, on the roster. But even seeking spiritual upliftment, you need to have ability to read, to write, and to comprehend. To have reading, what's called reading comprehension, it's very important. I may just I may just be a musician, but I'm I'm. I'm, I'm a huge fan of learning and, and I've always been gifted by uh, having a good reading comprehension level and a good understanding of a uh, vast subject and being able to compartmentalize the subject. And this is something if you, a lot of people have it, they just haven't been, hasn't been awoken. It isn't awoken in them. It's a critical thinking as well as involved with that. So a lot of music, <laughs> Believe it or not, a lot of musicians are very, very, uh, uh, you know, in tune with this kind of thinking. Uh, music is scales and cycles. First of all, you have, uh, if you're really learning theory, you got to have some sort of education. So it's really important.
And thanks a lot. That that was a real treat. That I, the uh, the comments are like off the chart. Everybody was so happy with that. So, oh baby. my god, that's so awesome. I can't see the comments, but I want to thank everyone out there. That's really awesome. Yeah, New maybe, York, my hometown. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, maybe if there's time, we'll do another one later. So absolutely, um, as many as you want. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Israel, um, born and spent some of your formative years in Trinidad. Right. And moved to the United States early in your childhood, lived in Long Island. Mm -hmm. That's right. All yes. right. Yes. Now, here's an interesting thing. Bad Brains, you know, highly influential band uh, when it comes to not only hardcore music, punk rock music, but what we know today as alternative music. They really have laid the tracks. The thing is, a lot of people don't know that this band, uh, for black members, which really was not common at the time. So how do you, a kid from Trinidad, wind up getting hooked up into this scene? Perfect, give me a second, let me uh, adjust something here. I did have the fan going for a minute because it was kind of hot, but now I'm, I'm freezing again. By the way, you guys, climate change is a real thing. <laughs> California at this moment, LA, I'm sitting in LA and it is 50 degrees outside, guys, okay? <laughs> It's 40 degrees every night in Los Angeles, 39 degrees. Climate change is a real thing. Okay, so how did I get here? <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say I love Trinidad, big up to Trinidad, all my people out there, all my fellow Trinidadians and my fellow Caribbean people rise up, stand strong, love and peace, everything we knew growing up that we've been taught, man, keep it in effect, respect your parents, grow up right, love, peace, love each other, stop the war and stop the fighting, okay? But really, I come here from, as a youth, I grew up uh, in a place called Chanfleur in the 70s, right at the bottom of a hill where there was a, a pretty much a jungle up top. I uh, would love to run up there. And now you have to imagine there's snakes and wild animals up there, but the city was based at the bottom of these hills. So it'd be like Long Island with a bunch of hills in the middle that contain real brushy areas that you have to but the cities were very beautiful. Trinidad has had oil since the uh, turn of last century. So there's a lot of money in Trinidad and it's a very beautiful place, but it's very rural too. It's very, to keep it very rural, at least when I was young. So we had a babysitter up top, Mrs. Mills. She would take care of us. And I loved being up in the bush. I studied uh, like a lot of the creatures up there going up there. It was very interesting to me, the whole thing. And then suddenly one night we decided to come to America and I remember not wanting to go. And the next thing I, but you know, it was, it was interesting as well, of course, uh, but I didn't want to leave. I remember that. But uh, when I got to, uh, to America, it was like, wow, we ended up on first, we ended up on fifth and 99th. So my first image of America is looking out my, uh, this window that uh, the family we went and stayed with down <laughs> south of, uh, f uh, I think it was uh, Fifth uh, Fifth Avenue. And it was all these buildings going down. And I was just like, wow, you know, it looked like a painting. I remember in my mind anyway, to where I remember it's like a painting of all these red bricked kind of, uh, all these structures going out into the distance. And I'm an artist, so that was one of my first artistic. So we moved from there to Long Island, uh, Patchogue about a year later and uh, was with my aunt. And uh, my other image of being, first image of being Long Island is seeing two weird movies, uh, uh, one called Gargoyles from the 70s, which is a very strange movie, and the other one called uh, Octoman. And I remember seeing those movies, and I was just like, whoa, I'd never seen anything like it. They just had never, it was so weird. And then uh, about six months later, we moved to Westbury, which is where I grew up in, in 1980. And that was, we were one of the first uh, black families in Westbury. I think there were two other families that were there. Uh, they were um, um, from America. We were Caribbean black people. My father was uh, kind of a light skinned guy. And, uh, you know, back in those days, people could uh, not tell. The society, I, I guess, wasn't as sophisticated as it is today. So a lot of people like would mistake lighter skinned blacks for, you know, I would call passing if you, if you know your history, you know. And I think. You know, basically, my dad had to do that to get us to Long Island, basically, because 
in a sense, you understand, uh, not all the way like the South, but in a sense, you know, he went by himself. But we showed up uh, to the house and within two weeks, three, I can't remember, but a very short period of time, we woke up and there was a cross burned on the lawn of our house. And that was the that was a very early experience that I had. So I, I, I actualized that it had fallen into the grass and burned into the ground. I was long, about 12 feet long, about 10 feet wide, and it had burned into the grass. And, you know, it just it, it was there like a black uh, sooted mess, a cross mess at the, at the next morning. I'm like, that uh, sent, uh, I think, my family into uh, kind of a like a negative spiral because that thing remained there for years. It wouldn't come out of the grass, you know. And uh, my dad actually let the grass go brown. And it wasn't until I got to Bad Brains that we were able to rip up that grass and put sod down. So I grew up with that that thing in my front yard. So it was very like a, it was very always a reminder when I'd walk out of my house down that little path, always to my right, there was that patch of grass that was burnt in the cross. So I learned very early a term, white flight. I was 12 years old. Uh, all of the people were selling their homes and they, I learned this phrase very early, white flight. And so it was very heady times, not like it is now. The kids are probably listening to me now and going like, whoa, that's really deep. But back then it was serious. It was really like uh, uh, very, it was a lot of division. So I end, we ended up in Long Island now. And, and now uh, now all of that kind of thing is past. It's 85, 86. Um, I'm in high school and I'm, I got back from Canada and I was opened up to my brother's record collection. My brother has a huge record collection up there. So I was opened up to like Jimi Hendrix and you know, Sex Pistols and stuff like that. I'd already known a lot of pop music. So I came home and hip hop, hip hop was what I was doing. I was a rapper. Uh, I was a hip hop MC. So all of this music was saving me basically from uh, the poverty we'd found ourselves in when I reached Long Island. We reached Long Island and Long Island isn't the way it is today. Westbury was very underdeveloped. There wasn't a set, there wasn't a store around except for the A&P and the 7-Eleven. So we grew up pretty much broke. Um, and the music, hip hop and uh you know just my my art, my involvement in art painting drawing this was what was saving my mind from absolutely losing it so i it was long island music art hip hop i did that for a long time until i eventually started um getting into music groups and this is all on my own all self taught you know <clears throat> and i started joining with music groups at the end of the 80s who played reggae. And naturally, if you're now playing with guitar players and drummers, right, you're going to get people who play rock and all kind of other. So I was being exposed to that. And here I was a rapper being exposed to music I'd already loved, but now I'm playing it. Like I'm not just rapping. I'm actually playing with rock and roll musicians now. So this is stuff I was already loving. It's great. And I just crossed over to rap and to hip hop. I had not known that uh, other bands were doing that. Um, in this world, I was, I'm, I still am the way that I was very like uh, sequestered into my own art, but it was an ethos I think was happening with hip hop and rock that I was just involved in unknowingly. Yeah. So it was crossing over and the Bad Brains, uh, to get into how I met them, uh, the Bad Brains were holding auditions in New York. And I had no idea about these auditions, but my friend, a uh, girlfriend of mine went down to try out and she slipped uh, Daryl my number, the bass player. And I was 20 at the time, living at my mother's house in Long Island in Westbury. And uh, my mother's a single mother, by the way. I got raised by a single mother in a poor house with, eat, growing up on sugar water, no frill cereal. You know what I mean? I, we had to make it, it was no way I wasn't going to do anything but fail, be like, you know, fa fail, make the horrible mistake of trying to sell drugs or become like an alcoholic or become, try to make it in sports. So it's just like no opportunities. Right. But a great school system, Westbury had it all. But it's just like, OK, the outside world was, was tough. So Bad Brains calls up. I'm living at my house. I'm working a normal job. But all night I'm doing music and working all day, all night doing music, working all day and performing every Sunday. 
and they got tapes and they saw me and they called me at my mother's house and they were like, is, um, you know, it was Israel there. It was Daryl. Um, the most unique voice I'd ever heard in my life, man. When he, I was just like, who is this? I thought it was a joke, you know, <laughs> I, did. I was like, this is a joke. This cannot be uh, the Daryl Jennifer. I had loved their band. You know what I mean? I had really loved the Bad Brains. So uh, that I'll pause there for another question, but that's, the Long Island journey to the moment uh, Bad Brains called me. And I'll All tell right. you the story of how it went on from there. Okay. Well, so you're 20 years old and all of a sudden you're singing for this legendary band. And it's, I hate to make it sound like you waltzed into this perfect situation, but uh, you know, if you watch uh, the Beastie Boys induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, the very first band they think in their acceptance speech is the Bad Brains. And there is this tremendous roaring applause from the audience. The average music fan is like, the who? Yeah, like, what? The you bad know, who? Yeah, bad that, bunny? That, that, that was me in 1985 before Eric Agero handed me the, the record. I was like, yes. the bad who? He's like, he's like, you go on your dreadlocks. You know, he's like older than me. He's like, you go on your dreadlocks and you're a Rasta man. You know, I'm like, I'm a Caribbean, my Rasta man. Blah, blah, blah. Funny, you so, know, we're like laughing, but he goes, You're not a Rasta until you listen to this. And I was like, The bad who? And it changed 85, it changed my life. But go ahead. Yeah. So talk me through that. What was that experience like? And and the recording of Rise, which by the way, for those of you who are watching, um, if you have not heard the Rise album, uh, support the band. You go to iTunes, buy the album. If the struggle is real, then you go to Spotify and you can stream it for free or let's do it on YouTube. But Rise, a very, very um, just incredible album that I think holds to this day. And we're going to talk about the lyrics because you were the primary songwriter for that album. So talk to me about joining the band and about what that experience is like. All of a sudden, you're traveling the world with the Bad Brains. Yes, it was it was incredible. Like, well, like I said, I was a young guy in Long Island growing up totally lost i was if you ask any of my classmates i was probably just a fun guy but totally like lost like uh in in my own world in a sense and uh you know i just started dealing with rastafari because finally i had found something that didn't make me feel lost when i saw Haile selassie i didn't feel lost anymore i didn't when i saw bob marley i didn't feel lost anymore i was like oh i found this is who this is, i woke up it was like 17 years of sleeping and i just woke up and so dreadlocks started growing in the back of my head and I became, I became who I am really. If you knew me before this, I was like, you know, I'd be like staring in space. Like what happened? I saw Salase, I just woke up, man. It's serious, serious thing. I'm not kidding. Um, but so I basically I had a friend of mine give me a Bad Brains record. His name is Eric. If he's out there, peace. Uh, and he, after that, I started looking for Bad Brains on my own. And like I said, I'd always liked uh, music. I heard the Sex Pistols in uh, Canada. But Bad Brains, man, you talk about a raw from the audience. When you put on, well, I had Eye Against Eye first. And I liked that record a lot. And then I went searching and I got the raw cassette. And something about that album, it, it, changes like i've come to say about music what music does for me it changes the frequencies in your brain if you listen to it for long if you listen to it enough you know listen to the album once you're like yeah it's a good album but if you really listen to it and listen to what they're doing on that record at 18 19 years old it's insane um it really does change you it changes you philosophically and it changes the frequencies of your heartbeat your brain your pulse rate and it gives you this this feeling like this is uh, more than music. It's a, it's a movement. It's more than music. Bad Brains is a movement. So I immediately understood that. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, I was able to conceptualize things really easy as a gift that I had. So I really understood that. And I just, I just liked it. So it stayed in my car. I had the cassette. It stayed in my tape deck. It stayed in my... Then I got the CD, you know, I started working for Tower Records. So when they called me, I had already... Uh, absorbed their music like a sponge unwittingly Un you know this is the works of god as doc would say god works man you know like ja works that's doc right so i'd already absorbed the songs 
so here I am. They, I, I'm sitting at my mom's, and uh, one day, and she knocks on my on the little door was, on the door I was sitting in the house, and she says, "Hey, there's a phone call for you." And I was like, "Okay, great." You know, hello. And this deep, rich voice tone gets on. He's is Israel there, right? I could never imitate his tone, but uh, I said, "Yeah, this is he." You know, and uh, he goes, "Hey, Israel, how you doing? This is uh, Daryl." Uh, Jennifer from the Bad Brains, and I was just like, like, uh, yeah, well, I was, you know, really? He was like, yeah. So I said, nah, who, who is this? You know, and no, this is really. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> I was like, what is going on? I'm like, and my mom's chilling in my like little room here. So he goes, no, no, man, this is Daryl. How you doing, brother? And I'm like, I'm great. How are you? He's like, yeah, I got your number from. Uh, uh, Latasha, and she said that uh, you're some kind of singer, man. And, uh, you know, and with that, I had recalled this conversation I had about a month before with Latasha, who said that she had given him my number. I said, oh, yeah, that's right, you know. And, and bro, we just started talking immediately about music. And, you know, I'm 20, going on 21. And Daryl Jennifer is on the phone with me. So we're just like talking about music. I'm a little nervous, but you know, I'm like talking to him. We're having a real easy conversation. And I noticed that. And we, we got along really easy. We talked about his family. We stayed on for about an hour. Then he says, uh, hey, so look, man, I like the vibes. You want to come up and, and try and sing for, uh, try, it, try it out. And I immediately went, yeah, of course, you know, let's do it. It was great, you know. Yeah. So I headed up to, Woods, to Kingston, New York. We went to Woodstock and the next, I met Daryl that night. Uh, it was a great meeting him. He was a super conversationalist, uh, you know, uh, just a great dude. Um, we met Doc the next morning, the same thing, just an amazing person. I couldn't believe it. When they were sitting on the couch, I always tell us it looked like the eye against eye cover. You know, yeah. I was just like sitting there going, whoa, this is Doc and Daryl, like crazy. This is, this is not happening as they say, you know, but it is. So we went to this barn they rehearsed in a literal barn in a field that was converted inside with a stage and sound system. And we went up in there and uh, they set up, put their guitars on and I sit in front of the mic. And the moment of truth was there and it was like, wow, this is really going to happen. So Daryl turns to me with his guitar, his bass, and he's like, wow, wow, you know, his guitar has this wow and he's like, Leans into the mic, so you know. So, what song you know, Israel? What song you want to do? I said, I want anything, man. You know, any song. I told you I know all your music. And then at that point, I could see him get serious. So he's like, Come on, man. He's like, What song do you know? Right? I said, I know everything, man. I said, Play it. And he's like, All right, Doc, play I Against I. I'm not I Against I, Reignition. He said, Reignition, you know, Reignition. I said, Yeah, he said, Play Reignition, Doc. And when they said, bada, boom, bada, bada, that's, yo, it sounded like the biggest stereo system in the world because it was them. It was their sound. Yeah. And I heard that crunch come on and it just went flip. It just flipped mode, man. And I just grabbed the mic and I started singing and it was gold. And I did it and we stopped. And then we did one more song, one of their old songs called Quickness. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why am I? Quickness. No, um, Soulcraft. And in the middle of Soulcraft, uh, Daryl stopped the song. And I thought, oh, man, I messed up. I didn't hit. I thought I was hitting it right, but I, I guess, okay. That's... But he had a smile on his face. You know, he's taking his face off. And he, like, looked at me. And he was like, good job, my guy. He said, come over here, man. I came over. He sat me down. He said, yo, man. No, first he said, Doc. This dude, the brother sound just like Joe, who is HR. He sound just like Joe, man. Doc said, yeah, I hear that. So he said, come over, man. I sat down. He said, yo, man, you sound great. And he gave me that whole conversation. And he said, you know all these all these songs, huh? And I, and I said, yeah. And he was, he was sitting there doing his thing. And so we talked, and we got up, and then he, we just did a set. We did like 40 minutes of songs. And I couldn't believe it was one of the best times of my life. So that's how that happened. After that, he just said to me, Israel, I don't want to see nobody else. You the man. You want to sing in this band or what? And I said, 
<laughs> oh, I said, I, of course I do. I said, that's of course, man. Let's do it. Yes. So let me ask you this. Everything. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I'm sorry, because uh, oh, yeah. we, we got a bunch of questions that we got to get through. So sure. I don't want to like interrupt, but kind of still got to kind of get to a, a lot of a lot of information here. So you go to the studio, you record Rise, which is probably lyrically just very gutsy. And it was the first time you're writing lyrics. Um, the interesting thing about that album with regards to my two favorite Bad Brains albums are I Against I and Rise. Um, and I kind of feel like you took I Against I to another level in that you were delving into topics that not that the brains were afraid of um, addressing, but maybe it just hadn't occurred to them. And the album, the themes really hold up today in 2021. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, I want to talk about some of these lyrics um, because it feels like you were just kind of prophesying ahead. Uh, and the great thing is that now these are topics that um, they're not really taboo to talk about. I think people are more courageous, generally speaking. Um, so the title track, Rise, did you ever question any of the things they taught you while you were at school? And did you ever question, oh, my teacher, why do you take me for a fool? You'll search for love, but they'll have none. This is the seed that they have sown. Don't be afraid. A better place has yet to come. And when they won't teach you or reach you or feed you, and all they have to do is leave you and deceive you. Now, um, inequality in education, um, particularly when it comes to inner city schools, um, I think people are just getting the courage to talk about it now. And people are talking about, uh, you know, improving schools in the inner city. And there's a whole fight between charter and public schools and, and making college education free. So at this time, it, we're talking 1992, 1993, what kind of uh, prompted you to write these lyrics? And Because really, I kind of feel like this is the first time it was being brought into the public forum. Yeah, um, but, but thank you. And uh, that is awesome that uh, you said those things. That's really a heartfelt thank you for studying that. Um, yeah, the lyrics of Rise were heartfelt. Uh, at the time, they were absolutely what I was going through. Um, what made me write those things? As a foreigner, I, I arrived in Long Island and I went to a great, what I, can, what I would consider for anyone else would be a great school. Westbury school system at, in, in the 1980s was excellent, full of people, very cultural. And it was probably the only reason I survived in, in the schooling system because I went to Westbury. But the problem was, as I, as I understood it, at 19, it was me. I was, I was the problem. So, but the real problem was no one identified that I was the pro that I had an issue. No one said, hey, this guy is having a hard time fitting in, or he's lost, or he's intelligent, but we don't know how to reach his intelligence. And I'm sitting there like a person that is not acknowledging all of this and not seeing it happen. And so I decided to address it in Rise. It's something that I've been uh, talking about in conversations, uh, songs I had written before had addressed uh, the lack of education. I am a huge proponent of education. Uh, I am, I have always been, even before I became a Rasta man, although I'm, I wasn't always studying in school because of my home life was kind of hard. I always valued education and getting getting myself uh, full of uh, knowledge. So uh, questioning things that they taught you in school, African history was omitted. I remember having to have a sit-in because they wanted to change Black History Month to Multicultural Week in Westbury High School. And in 88 or 89, uh, we or I organized a sit-in and blocked the first assembly 
of the Multicultural Week. And then we had a meeting. I demanded that the uh, Black History Month be kept in the school. And that was one of the first victories I got as a person in yeah. 10th grade. And those type of things was what brought like Black history. And then, of course, the history of Haile Selassie, the, the royal family of Ethiopia, the idea that the Hebrews, uh, Solomon had a baby with the king, uh, queen of Ethiopia, and that king had a lineage of kings in Ethiopia that reigned until uh, Haile Selassie in the 1930s. And uh, we should have known all of that because of what the implications of all of that. And so all of these type of things, um, you know, music education, uh, I, I was exposed, but they didn't tell you nothing about punk rock or other musics that I knew, reggae, oh, you know, it's a whole bunch of the truth about the world situation after World War II isn't exactly explained to you. The truth uh, about God and, and understanding that a lot of the biblical stories are, uh, are also tied in with astronomy. They leave you in the darkness about that. So all of these things that is wrapped up in those first couple lines. And then I felt because I was on free lunch, my pam family was poor. So I got I got free lunch, which was blessed or but I couldn't get like the real good lunch, you know, like I had to get the free lunch and I had to, uh, you know, there was different tiers of lunch. If you paid, you could get the, the better lunch, like sloppy joes and stuff. And so all of that, when they won't teach or reach or feed you, and all they do is leave you, deceive you, be true to yourself and save your mind, a lesson for the young. You see, be true to yourself. This is all you got is your mind. So you got to keep your mind intact. Go ahead. And a lesson for the young. So that's basically those lyrics. Right. You know. All right. So in keeping with, you know, your mind, let's jump ahead to track number two, Miss Freedom. Now, I want to preface these lyrics and... Correct me if I'm wrong, but the year is 1993. You're about to perform in front of a crowd of 20,000 people in Poland. Yes. The Iron Curtain has just fallen yes. fairly recently. Yeah. So the lyrics to Miss Freedom read, check out the government, inject the innocent with subliminal criminal vibes with the message attainable, station to station, telling lies to a nation addressed by the president. You should all be aware that a leader who fooled you and told you lies to get elected rejected a civil rights bill with skill. And before you're about to get what, on what to is, stage, the next line is, what is he saying? Question mark. Subliminal vibes again. Yeah. Meaning that I remember when when he had rejected those. That's uh, that civil rights bill was huge. Oh, we're we're going to we're going to yeah, get into I'm that sorry. in a minute. <laughs> but as you're about to perform this song. In front of a country where communism is just kind of like faded away, you get stopped by the CIA and you're basically given a very stern warning. Yeah. So well, we, were always, we were always treated nicely uh, by all the governments we visited in the lands of the world, especially our own government, which I love and treasure very much, the American government, although I... I have a lot of things I want to solve with the American government, you know, but I love and treasure our government quite a bit. And uh, I think that it's one of the best on the planet for its potential to cause and to increase change and, and peace and, and harmony on the planet. Its potential is, is unlimited. So, but yes, in those days, uh, they approached us not once or twice, but many, uh, many times government officials would approach us, but most notably in Poland, to say to the manager or to say to myself, hey, you know, go easy. You can't be busting down this much, you know? And this was cool. It was understandable that these kind of messages would come our way because people have to, uh, you know, you got to be aware all the time of all points of light. You know what I mean? All the light has all the points. So I was very aware of that. And when we went on stage, uh, I said what I had to say. Mm -hmm. I, I said what I had to say. I didn't, didn't uh, curtail anything because I don't think I, I said anything uh, aggressive. I've never said I'm a peaceful person. I love peace. I can't shed blood because I'm a Nazarene. So there's your, there's your violence going out the window, right? I can't stand up, right? So like, I don't, I don't even eat meat. I haven't eaten meat since I was 17 years old. I can't hurt a thing. 
But what I do want is change for people and positive change. And sometimes talking about the president is uh, is is what it's about. Sometimes saying, hey, you know, you're the leader of the free world and you have to act in a certain way that increases our ability to be the leader of the free world, not in a way that diminishes it like uh, Donald Trump has done by organizing his insurrection against our government, which is where we create changes to uh, create a better world. If he doesn't like what's going on in the government, then make some laws, change the laws. Stand up, uh, get your position together, uh, get your philosophy together, and then go to the Congress and present your philosophy like Joe Biden is doing. Sign some orders. But you know what? He did that in a sense. But you know, his philosophy was white supremacy. And that's my problem with it. People say, oh, why you aren't with the, re the rebellion? Well, I say, well, isn't racism a, a, a deal breaker for you? <laughs> you know, rebellion, that's insane. I'm not into destroying, I'm not an anarchist, and I'm not a racist. First yeah. of all, I would be against myself. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's insane. So, yeah, so it was a very important thing to keep it real about politics, but we were approached about some topics like that and not to be to be careful. <laughs> in, in keeping with the theme of change, um, I saw you guys on the Rise Tour. You're opening up for Living Color, or it was a co-headlining tour, actually. Um, don't ask me how. My boss is watching, so I'm very sorry. I'm about to admit this Hi, boss. on the internet. And Whoops. if if my mother's watching, mom, this is a long time ago, but we snuck into the VIP section, uh, a friend of mine and I, with the Roseland Ballroom, uh, and you guys were opening up uh, what was co-headlining tour with uh, with Living Color and the Stain Tour, and there was I had seen the Bad Brains before, but there was just this feeling in the air that something is changing and it's for the better. Um, the crowds were very diverse. You had hip hop kids, you had metal kids, you had punk rock kids, you had Rastas. I mean, it was everything. Loved it, man. It was a this, great time. Here's the most interesting thing that happened that night. So again, we snuck into the VIP section. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And I saw Busta Rhymes, who at the time was still with Leaders of the New School, and he's talking to Fred Schneider, mm -hmm. the lead vocalist of the B-52s, which for those of you who don't know, has been living as an openly gay man since, I mean, before it was acceptable, way before it was acceptable. And I'm sorry, that's my computer just kind of giving me the, uh, the heads up. Um, I'm seeing all these people together and I'm like, this wouldn't have happened five years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it really felt like, okay, th the time is right. We're about to change. We needed it, bro. But then as a nation, we kind of step backwards. And the interesting thing about this is that shortly after that tour, you're approached by Madonna. 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 Like the queen of shock who says, I love you guys. I want to sign you. So you're talking about going from one major record label to the next under the condition that you tone down the political. And tone. that was the issue. Okay. That was the issue. We had songs like like uh front the row as i blast through the pages of a western history text i'm made vexed by the information i suspect keeps us separated and makes life complicated so some could get high while most of us are living jaded it's overrated for masters and slaves who got emancipated then faded awaiting skies to open holy waters blessing fingers and dirty preachers coming out money winners and sinners, dang, ooh, Bobby Lon, you're gonna fall, drop, yo, you die the front of row, laying down, ooh, Bobby Lon, you're gonna fall, drop, yo, you die the front of row. When real power is taken from the poor, divided on the killing floors with scores of whores, copping drugs from crooked cops who do drugs and arrest thugs for selling herb and exchanging verbs, the power structure could never be unbiased when only one color can sit in the highest. Who represents the nation of the poor when money lines divide, complexion seems to hide? Dang, ooh, Bobby Lon, you're gonna fall, drop, yo, you die the front of roll and down, ooh, Bobby Lon, you're gonna fall, drop, yo, die the front of roll. That's front of roll. The other one was killer. Be like, 
I will be your killer. Um, look at the beggars on the streets of fame, laughing at children who don't understand that sometimes it's simply just a matter of uh, conviction under violent conditions. It was bad. If I could sing it at full voice, it'd be, his melody was bad. We had like seven amazing, incredible songs. Down in front of the roll, the guitar was like, bam, 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 doom, 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 bam, doom, doom. it was just crunching. So we were ready to take 95 by storm. And all of a sudden it was like, your lyrics are too crazy. <laughs> your lyrics are too political. You gotta stop, your lyrics are too getting. And I was like, what, we're, so um, for good or bad at that point, I started feeling it was three years, three and a half years and Rise was, uh, had made changes. I, I could clearly see that Rise had made changes. I was very happy. So I thought, you know, we just, we just kind of, our boats just kind of sailed into other directions. But, um, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of walked away from it. Mm -hmm. Um and was uh wasn't i wasn't able to look at rise for a while um such an emotional and it was such a deep dive into or high fly whatever you want to look at it into into that music and into that you know bringing that energy every night you know man just manifesting that spirit and keeping up the, like you said, you gotta be fearless because of what I'm saying, you know? And HR's, Daryl and HR's lyrics too were always, but they were more spiritual, like you were saying, HR's and Daryl are more spiritual as opposed to political. I think I was a younger kid influenced by Chuck D, a public enemy, influenced by Eric B and Rakim, influenced by, you know, all, all the greats, and then the, the, the rock and roll great. So I was more political, Bob Marley. I was more looking for a, a spiritual change is what you do inside. And I was more fighting for a political change, the external as well. I thought that that was needed. So, yeah. You were telling me this story about being in a, in an industry party and you're sitting next to Mariah Carey and, and, and all these other artists. Was there ever kind of like that conflict within you where you kind of felt like it's great to be here, but politically, I'm not entirely sure I agree with what's going on. No, because I loved all of them. <laughs> I was like fascinated. I was like, Mariah Carey's in the house. Like, I was like, Cypress Hill. I was like, you know, Super Cat. Like all the people that were on Sony Columbia, well, at least a lot of them were in these part. And Boca Raton was insane. When I got there, I'd never been in such opulence. Yeah, I'm a poor kid, you know, and this is, I was just like, so I was, I was scared. I remember wanting to talk to Supercat and he was sitting on a couch and I remember wanting to approach him and I couldn't, I was just like, I can't, I don't know what I would say. I go over there and be like, I don't, you know, Supercat, like I didn't know how to, but everybody, it was amazing. And I never felt, I know, you know, I don't judge anyone, man. I love everybody. I have my own political view and my own philosophies. But realistically, if you meet me, I just, I'm just chill. You may hear me talk the way I'm talking now, but I'm not trying to say, hey, and you must do this or you, this is how you must be. I'm not like that at all. I think it takes all types of people to make up the world. Black, white, you know, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, gay, straight. Uh, all, all types of people make up this planet and it's going to be God that'll judge them. Not, not man, you know, not, not a guy like me, of course, or anyone else. It's going to be God or Donald Trump or whoever heck is thinking they're going to judge people. It's going to be God that'll judge people. So I, I leave it up to that. We got some questions that came in. Um, is your name original or did you adapt a name to match your new identity? That's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that because I've been wanting to talk about that in interviews and no one has ever asked me that in the 30 years I've been doing music. So who asked that question? Let's, let's put their it name out there. Two people. One was actually my boss. My boss, I, I what I did was I combined the uh, the questions. Uh, one was, uh, was a student um, and the other was my boss uh, because the other question was, um, does I stand for your identity? Ah, that's beautiful. Wow, how about that? Two questions that I've always wondered. Why don't anyone ask me about this? 
<laughs> no, that it, that that this really is not my original name. Um, at 17, I well, you have to understand. Um, I went through a really hard time with my family life. My parents uh, descended into alcoholism. Uh, after that cross was found on my lawn, my dad changed within two years. He was just quiet and like, I don't know what, what was wrong with him. happened to him. He went from being really chill to being really like not saying a word. And my mother was tripping and they were drinking a lot and they broke up. But my dad, I had since forgiven him. I haven't seen him since like the late 80s or something. In my heart, I've since forgiven him. But back then I was very kind of angry with that. And I was just like, this is untenable. You know, this happened. This is ridiculous. So I wanted nothing. Basically, it started as a seed where I wanted nothing to do with who I was or where I came or what I what what my family was, right? I wanted and Ross Farai, I had seen Heidi Selassie and Bob Marley. And like I said, I'd woken up from a sleep. You know, I was one minute I was staring into space, lost. The next minute I was in charge and knowing what, where I was going. And like, I had woken up. And I think my brothers reacted weird to that too. They were like, who is this guy? You know, like, but I decided at 18 that I was going to change, uh, change my name. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to call. I didn't know who I was going to be uh, as this new birth. I remember being influenced by Malcolm X and other black people who had changed their name in the seventies. That's where it started. That's the kernel of it. Black people were changing their names in the seventies. And I was, I was influenced by that, but I didn't, I didn't know. And I went to the Rasta house in 88 through the invites HR. Actually, before I met Bad Brains, I knew HR going to concerts, shows to see him, local shows. He invited me to the 12 tribes of Israel. And when I got to the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, that's how they address each other in the 12 tribes of Israel. The Rastafarians say Israel, or they address the house when they speak at the podium. All right, Israel. So or, greetings, Israel. Uh, when I first got there, they were calling me Israel. And uh, the name set with me, and I didn't realize it was a generalized name, but it just set with me for some reason in my psyche. I've been reading the Bible and all of that, man. I've grown up on the scriptures, man. And the name just something happened, like music happens to me. It just it just set with me, like I said, like it set like concrete. And I remember me and same dude Eric was sitting in my mom's crib one day outside on the lawn. I was sitting on the corner. I said, Eric, I said, Yo, man, I'm I'm getting rid of my name. He was like, What? And we were also in hip hop, right? So we were having like tag names like Pop Art, Prince Damel. I was always having names. So I said, Eric, man, I'm a Rastafarian, you know, I can't keep this Babylonian slave name, Derek. My name was Derek, which is actually a Jewish name, which means the way, Derek. It's a Jewish word. And my last name was Pinto. That's my family name, Pinto, P-I-N-T-O. So my name was Derek Pinto. That's why I went to Westbury Public Schools as, Derek Pinto. So Derek Pinto was sitting on a car and looking at Eric and saying, I'm no longer Derek, Eric. Derek and Eric, we used to trip on that too. I said, my name is Israel. And he was like, and I said, yo, man, I'm Israel. And I'm the tribe of Joseph in the Rastafarians because I'm born in February. So my name is going to be Israel Joseph. I, like Heidi Selassie, I, and the I means identity. And that is the truth, whoever figured that out. But it also means the I in the self, God in the self. I have God. I have found Jah, the I, and Haile Selassie, I. But what it really is, too, is I became Joseph first for a minute in two houses of Israel, which is the guy who sits in for the Joseph. I was Joseph second and then Joseph first. That is also what that is. So, yes, changed my name from Derek uh, Pinto to Israel Joseph, in, and I legally changed it. I went to the courts at 18. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I legally did it i represented myself i got i had to do it in the newspaper the court papers and some other things get a new social security card a whole new identification as a human being and then i emancipated myself from my parents i i cut all ties to them and i became emancipated uh that it's actually at 17 i did this because at 18 you're already emancipated but i remember i couldn't 
I didn't want to wait. So at 17, I changed my name to Israel Joseph and I emancipated myself and I became a Rastafarian by in the court documents. Like I, you know, I registered my religion and I've been that ever since. Wow. It's not been changed ever since. Yeah. But Derek Pinto is still alive. Yeah. He is a kid. I always say Israel Joseph came to protect him. You know, mm-hmm. he's in there somewhere, but Israel wrapped him up and said, all right, I got you. We're, we're going to make it through this ex- experience and I got you. But he, that boy is never going to die. He's still in there. Yeah. All right. Well, Israel, I can't believe it. We're, our hour is almost up. Well, if I, 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 ask... I did want to, I did want to read these things for Black History Month real quick. Is there any way I can get through this? You can do that. And if okay. you would, uh, if you would be so gracious as to give us another song, we'd be more than happy to have that as well. Okay, well, more than it, more than another song. What I'd like to do, I will do another song, but I'd like to read a, a list. Okay, I made a list last night, as you guys can see, it's an actual paper uh, list. I don't know if you'll see that, but yeah, there it is, an actual paper list. So, guys, these are achievements of Black Americans since it's Black History Month that we uh, could not live without. By the way, I was going to show this is the Rise record, right? Here we go, the Rise, and this is uh, the inside cover. That's us. It's a pretty cool record, man. It's awesome the way they made it. That's Sony, right? Uh, Sony did that, but I chose I chose that cover. That was a fractal. The first time anyone had ever seen a fractal. These were new, and it looked like a tunnel. And I thought, oh, it's like Rise, because it looks like a tunnel, but it's red, gold, and green. I was like, let's use that one. You know, it's like I was like, what are these? They were like, it's fractals. Anyway, so here we go. So these are achievements by African Americans that we cannot live without. Now, if you guys listen to these things carefully, you will really be amazed, okay? So Alfred Crail, or Kral, invented ice cream. George T. Sampson invented the clothing dryer, the dryer. John Pickering, the first blimp with an electric motor and, and guiding controls. Benjamin Banneker invented America's first clocks. George Alcon, the X-ray spectrometer for viewing faraway galaxies. Granville Woods was like God. I mean, this guy invented, um, the su- he created the subway system. So in New York, you understand this is, was invented by a black person, the subway systems. Street cars, he, he created, uh, patented these. Uh, the electric flow for these machines. He, he created the roller coaster. This is Granville Woods, guys. The telephone, okay, Alexander Graham Bell was another person who had a patent for it. Granville Woods had a patent for the telephone as well. And also the distancing between trains, the signaling distancing. Granville Woods created all of these technologies. Uh, Joseph Smith, uh, the water sprinkler. Uh, Marie Van Button, uh, the um, home surveillance and closed circuit television. That's Marie uh, Van Britten Brown. I'm sorry, Marie Van Britten Brown. Alexa, Alexander Miles, the automatic elevator doors, okay? John Albert Burr, the lawnmower, okay? Louis Latimer, the, the sockets that you screw electric lights into and the filament that makes the lights burn. John Lee Love, pencil sharpener, okay? The, the pencil sharpener. Richard Spike the automatic gear shift for cars you know when you get in your car and you just change it on like drive like a black person in patented and created that um uh jan metzlinger the shoe lashing machine you know when they put it on the thing and the, 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 the they just sew the shoes together it holds it together so they can show, sew the shoes that was created sarah brown created the ironing board Garrett, uh, Garrett Morgan, the gas mask and the traffic light, and he made it red, gold, and green because the uh, Ethiopian colors are red, gold, and green. Alice Parker created central heating. So when you go into an office and it's all central heating ducts, that was Alice Parker. Um, Percy Julian, um, he, he synthesized uh, the drug for glaucoma and two more, George Grant, created the golf tee for Tiger Woods. It's not the first black person. Fir- actually, a black person created the golf. And last one is Shirley Jackson, who was absolutely amazing. She created the touchtone telephone. Okay, when you pick up a telephone, you touch the buttons. That's Shirley Jackson. Uh, call waiting, caller ID, and the portable fax machine. And these are just 20 
black inventors and they're over there are hundreds of black inventors so my point is that we must become familiar with uh, uh all of this i mean uh, granville woods created the subway system what how many so many racist people get on a subway and be like we're going to new york you know what i mean like yeah. dude how many racists get off an elevator and be like that's yeah, rolling elevator you know i mean we have to understand that black history month it's always been something for me because look i come I, my brother is way darker than me i see how the differences are in life it's always been important to me to celebrate people of diverse and uh, diversity. And with that, I'm thanking you for, for uh, allowing me to do that. And I want to thank all the students for being out there. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to play. I didn't really plan to play, yeah. uh, but I'm always down for requests. OK, well, it seems that uh, something in the spirit of Bob Marley is in order. How about we just make something up real quick? You say you want a better world. Gotta work for that. You say you want a better world. Gotta work for that, but you can't give it up so fast. Gotta do your thing, make it last. Say you want a better world. But you know, gotta love everyone you meet. You got to take it nice and easy. Just love everyone you meet. Today we've got a lot of problems. The government got to solve them. And if they don't, we're gonna be lost forever. Check out the government, they running it. They trying to get us done with it is not easy to do this thing, but we got to stand up for what's right. Try not to fight. Try to love tonight. You got to love one another. Love one another. So we can be, so we can be so free. So we can do what we need. Rule the map. Rule the map. Rule the map with love. Come on, rule the map. Rule the map. Freestyle, rule the map with love. Come on, I say, rule the map. Rule the map. Rule the map with love. You got to rule the map. Rule the map. Rule the map with love. Rule the map with love, y'all. Peace. Thank you so much, Israel. Israel, living you know, part of history in terms of music. Thank you so much for being here. And if I'm not mistaken, Fireburn's release is Don't Fight the Youth, and you can find the EP on- Don't Stop, don't stop the Youth. Don't Stop the Youth. Okay, I'll yep. make that correction. And I would encourage everybody who's watching to check out the EP. Um, that is my new um, workout. Every time I'm working out, I, uh, I pump that up. And uh, play it several times because it's such a short album. That's my only uh, critique of it is, is it's too short, man. Well, we had a – we were going to make it longer, but a Todd Youth was saying, hey, you know, we'll wait for the record um, and put the songs on the record. Uh, and we had planned and we have a lot of stuff written and, and, and it's all, like, you know, worked out. But uh, Todd passed away. Yeah. Unfortunately, so it, the record never manifested. So that's all we have. But um, I heard it's pretty worth it. <laughs> yes. okay. This is the new record here. Um, if you guys can go on line, uh, this is my new album. It's called Meltdown. I mean, this it's like really hard to see it because uh, it is 
yeah there we go so this album is called meltdown it's available on all of that right there if you guys want to go online it's um i can tell you how to get there read it out it's israel joseph dot here now dot com so that's i s r a e l j o s e p h i it's israel joseph i i s r a e l j o s e p h i dot h e a r n o w dot com forward slash okay and you can pick up the new record it's really like full of great um Great music, man. A lot of people are really digging this record. So go ahead and pick up Meltdown. Check out Rise. Check out Fireburn. There's lots of records with them, like Shine and Don't Stop the Youth. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Shine and, uh, um, oh, God, um, Controller. Um, there's uh, Out of Many One. So lots of lyrics, lots of lots of good vibes out there, man. Dad, thank you for telling all about it. Israel, thank you so much, and um, let's keep in touch, man. This is this is a real treat. Awesome! I'm glad to have done this, and uh, and I thank you, Carlos, and everyone out there listening. Thanks so much. It was awesome visiting you guys. I hope to get to New York, and maybe we can do this live one day when coronavirus goes away. Hey, why not? Bring you into yeah. the school, and you have a nice uh, performance, everybody. Okay, and just know whenever you're in New York, you have a friend. All right. I love that, man. Stay in touch. Thank you, Carlos. This was awesome. Thank you, Rastafari. All right.